know, in pop culture today, everybody talks about living your best life, living your best life, and all that. <laughs> but um, I want us to kind of unpack and talk about what it means to live a blessed life, okay? All right. So the Sermon on the Mount, um, the, the message that I just shared um, in Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12, is a cornerstone of Christian life. In this message, Jesus shares truth about what it means to have effective living. Now, the heart of this message is that to have an effective Christian walk is to have God in every area of our lives. And so in that respect, we are blessed. Now, each verse, all nine verses, give a different aspect of what it means to be blessed. But notice this has nothing to do with material gain or anything tangible. It's more about the attitude of a believer which make him or her blessed. We live in a society where people think that being blessed is, by, is measured by the quantity of what you have when it's really measured by the quality of who you are. Here Jesus is giving us a formula to being blessed. So the first thing we see here, let's talk about what that word blessed means. So this way it's used by Jesus denotes the fullness that comes to a person who obeys the word of God. In Psalms 1, verses 1 and 2, David says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he, and she, meditates on it day and night. Here David is saying, blessings and true happiness come from those who obey the Lord. Here he's saying, it's not enough to have head knowledge about who God is. You've got to have heart kneeling as well. That means a perpetual and constant yielding to the will of the Lord leads us to being blessed. Amen? Amen. So the first thing we see here is that we have to be willing and obedient and continuously want to do as God says. Now, contrary to what we see today, you cannot truly be blessed without having an obedience to God. We live in a time where it seems like everybody is coming up and getting ahead in life, but if we really were to look at the souls of people, we would see how lacking and not really blessed they really are. There's nothing you can have or obtain or get outside of Christ that is really a blessing. And so we've come to this message where Jesus speaks to us, and it's really a need for us to mature, to understand that there's got to be more to it than what you can physically touch or see in order for you to consider yourself blessed. This message is relevant to us in 2019 as we see so many taglines to live our best lives, but the majority of what people are considering their best lives has nothing to do with Jesus. Mm. The main problem we have today is that we like to have Jesus as the love of our lives, but not the Lord of our lives. To be Lord or ruler of our lives would be requiring us to relinquish all control we have and let him lead. We don't like that. We, te we treat Jesus like a love interest and give him parts of us and allocate and decide what time we'll make for him. When in reality, he should be a life interest and have complete and total access. So today, I've come to give you a simple life hack for free, free of charge, that if you really want to be blessed, if you really want to advance in the next year to come, it starts with being obedient. And directly and closely related to the level of blessed you are is the level of obedience that you are. That means God will always be sovereign, but it, he'll always be sovereign king, but your obedience decides what kind of kingdom subject you'll be. It decides how you live in the kingdom. From this we understand that the word of God serves as a blueprint for our lives. Psalms 119.105 says, The word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. That means the, the blueprint is in the Word of God. It's a guide. Amen? Amen? Okay. So these nine different things, blessed is, um, are what we call the Beatitudes or the attitudes to be. These attitudes show us the kind of character suitable for those who say they are subjects in the kingdom of God. That's you and I. All right? So notice again, these are not about worldly gain, but about eternal gain. That challenges us to look at what we view as priority and take a good look at what we treasure. What do you value? Who or what is important to you? That's your treasure. 
What do you hold as most important? But is it also important to the Lord? Or can it be taken away because it's temporary? Matthew 6, 20 through 21 in the message version says, Don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths or corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile your treasure in heaven where it is safe from moss and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is is the place where you most want to be and actually end up being. The things, people, and places, etc., we value most often influence our thoughts, actions, habits, and lifestyle. The challenge is to know whether or not the things we desire actually line up with the Word of God and if they push you to obedience or push you from obedience. So many people are not experiencing life the way they want to because they're not being obedient the way God wants them to. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So he doesn't have an issue with you having things. He has an issue with those things having you. He has an issue when you care more about material things than you do your relationship with him. So here he's telling us the kind of people we need to be. He tells us how to be sober-minded and kingdom-minded. So in order to do this, we need a little attitude adjustment. Amen? Okay. So my dad, and um, I can preach about him now. It's my journey. He always preaches about me, so this is good for me. This is good. Uh, my dad, as he's gotten older and advanced in age, he's had to see a chiropractor, right? And he goes to the chiropractor to get these things called adjustments, right? You know, anybody had back pain before? Any, anybody can testify. Sometimes you need like a little reset, right? Right, right? So he goes to the chiropractor, and the chiropractor sets his back straight. You know, over time, you have wear and tear from working hard, lifting things, going back and forth, just the everyday um, in and outs of life. And so the chiropractor, he goes and sees him every now and then, to get back on track and get straight. So I've learned when my dad goes to the chiropractor, he looks forward to going. Sometimes he takes Bishop with him and they have time without me and that's okay. <laughs> but they go to the chiropractor and they look forward to it. What if we started seeing our father like a good doctor chiropractor who could just get us back on track and adjust us where we need to be adjusted? What if we saw God trying to change our attitude and character like that of an adjustment, something that can set us back straight and be in our own benefit. What if we looked at correction from God really as an act of love? That's what Jesus is, is telling us and challenging us here with this message, showing us what it really means to be blessed. These blessings that he's talking about is our character traits. It's the way that we are, not, what, not the things that we have. Amen? <laughs> So he gives us nine different phrases. Blessed, right? So let's look at these, if that's okay, if I have a few minutes to talk to you about these. Okay. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So the first area that we have to change in terms of our character is our humility. Poor in spirit means to be empty of yourself so that God can fill it with him. How humble are you? People who really are blessed and are humble, know that money isn't the only kind of currency that gets you places in life. The favor of God takes you places the American dollar and the euro never can. Proverbs 3 and 34 says, The Lord mocks the markers, but is gracious to the humble, to those who are humble before God and make it their business to having God as priority. Humility is when you empty yourself completely. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, am I really humble? Am I really okay with there just being God in my life? If he did nothing else for me, would I really be okay with that? To be poor in spirit, now I'm not saying you have to literally be poor and raggedy and not look great. I'm not saying that. To be poor in spirit is to empty of yourself and realize your need for God. Amen? Amen. So am I humble? Verse 4, Jesus goes on to talk about the blessing of those who mourn. Here he's talking about having a sensitivity to the Spirit and having a sensitivity to when we're wrong or when we've sinned. Godly sorrow or godly mourning um, is essential to our lives because it brings us or helps us recognize our need for God. It's a dangerous place to be when you become immune to sin, when you no longer feel convicted 
about being wrong or doing wrong. And in the day and age we live in, where everybody has to be right and everybody has to be seen, right. it is a blessing to know you have to run to the presence of God um, for fulfillment and to be reset and be corrected and just to repent and go before him. That is being blessed. We live in a society where people aren't becoming desensitized and immune to the presence of God. And so when you have that pull and you feel that need for him, that is one indication that you are blessed. Do I have a hunger for God? Having a sensitivity to when we've committed sin also eliminates self-righteousness and judgment and it makes us more gracious toward other people as well. It causes a hunger for him, for God, that only he can fill. Luke 6 and 21 says, You're blessed when you're ravenously hungry. Then you're ready for the meal. The messianic meal, excuse me. So how sensitive are we to the areas that we've fallen short? How bad do we really want God? You know how people say, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want him? Do you want him enough to be sensitive to when you've fallen short and need to run toward him? Or is there pride? Or are you so busy picking out the faults of everyone else, you can't see your own. The blessing for those who mourn is those who recognize and have godly sorrow towards sin. So to, to be sensitive is to run to Jesus. Next, he talks about meekness. Now, meekness is not a, often a word we use in our day-to-day -day, um, lingo and jargon, but it means, and it boils down to self-control and your ability to remain at peace. Self-control, what a word in today's day and age. Like Self-control, when you say it to people, they, they get automatically offended, but you know why that is? Because we have so much lacking of it. The Bible tells us that a person without self-control is like a city without broken walls. Could you imagine if we didn't have boundaries on the road and regulations, people would just be driving all over the place, accidents would happen. Self-control prevents accidents from happening in our lives. You can tell when a person lacks self-control because they're all over the place. We, excuse me, meekness is not weakness, and it's a willingness to be at peace at all costs. Peace with God, peace with myself, and peace with everybody else around me. Peace with God first and foremost, because if you don't have peace with God, there will be no peace with yourself or peace with anybody else. Peace with yourself, because if you are at peace with yourself, you don't attack and look for ways to take it out on other people. So they all go hand in hand. You are blessed when you have something that cannot truly be stolen, and that is your peace. You have so many people today who just want peace and don't know where to get it and don't have it. And when we say peace, we don't mean like um, lack of war or, you know, like we need that peace too, but inner peace, a settling of the soul and the spirit. So many people don't have that. To be blessed is to have peace with God and peace with yourself. Amen? Amen? Okay. So verse 6, we've already touched on a little bit about obedience. Um, but it really means to desire and want what God wants. Those are the people who whose lives will most be filled with God. To truly be obedient is to say and really mean not my will but yours be done. Sometimes we say that like, not my will. And then we have like a plan B or a plan C, D, E, F, G in our back pocket. But to truly have a surrendered heart is to trust God without having um, an escape clause. Or having like um, a prenuptial kind of agreement mentality about it. Like just in case this doesn't work, I know what I'm going to do. Just in case you don't come through for me. What, fa what, what little faith we have that way. To really be obedient is to say, without condition, I'm going to follow you. Even if this doesn't work out the way that I anticipate or wanted to, I'm going to listen and follow your leading. Those who seek the kingdom of God first and hunger after God have everything with, and everything that they need. You're blessed when you desire to have what God wants for you above what you want for you. We like, there's a scripture we like to always quote, God will give you the desires of your heart. And that's true, but he gives you those desires when they mirror his desires for you. You can't just wish for a million dollars and God will give that to you. That's really not what he wants for you. And he knows you're best to do it with money. You can't wish for a great spouse. And he knows you like to flirt with everything that walks by. 
He gives you the desires of your heart when your character is in alignment with his character and that's what he wants for you. So obedience. Amen? Amen. Verses 7 and 9 go hand in hand where they're talking about mercy and compassion and reconciliation. In an age of scandal, literally, great show, <laughs> revenge, and the strange desire people have to see other people get what they deserve, you are blessed and doubly blessed when you have mercy and compassion for those even who don't deserve it. Amen. How interesting is it that the Lord's Prayer says, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's a prayer where we ask for forgiveness, but the condition is we have to also forgive other people too. That's right. The attitude we must have is that of utmost compassion and mercy and reconciliation. Now, reconciliation is striving to make and keep peace between any parties who are at odds with each other. Would that be on your job, at school, in your relationships? It's peace at all costs, even when those people involved don't deserve peace. Reconciliation kind of reminds me, and uh, reconciliation means to bring two parties back to peace with each other. That's what Jesus did for us. He reconciled us to the Father. Right. One party who was completely innocent and not at fault, and the other party who was and made peace between the two. <coughs> so if Jesus Christ can be the ultimate reconciliation facilitator, why can't we? Why can't we strive um, and ascribe to drama-free living where we keep peace? That's what he wants for us. You're blessed when revenge is no longer your agenda. You're blessed when you no longer want to see people get what they deserve or I'll get you like you got me. When you can rise above and be the bigger person, you are blessed. Jesus prayed, he paid the ultimate price for you to avoid the wrath you deserve. So I think you can let somebody else avoid the wrath they may or may not deserve. That's what it means to be a peacemaker, to be one who is a reconciler, to be one who shows mercy and compassion, even when they don't deserve. Amen? Okay. Verse 8, and we'll go back a little bit. Jesus says to be blessed is to be truly set apart in holiness and have standards that reflect the righteousness of God. The pure in heart. That means those with no ulterior motives. Those with clean hands. Whose character cannot be exchanged for a come up. You've got to be able to ask myself, how's my heart? How's my motive? A person who's truly blessed lives a holy life. Now holiness is not a dress code. It's not a look. It's a posture of your heart. It's the reason why you do what you do. So to be truly holy is to put God as priority in our lives, and everything we do reflects that priority. Holiness says, I won't sell out to sell books, to sell records, to have a podcast, to be viral. Holiness says, I won't do what everybody else is doing just to fit in or be noticed. Holiness says I can be noticed because of who already has noticed me. Holiness says God means more to me than any person or anything could ever be. It means to obey the command in 1 Peter 1 and 16 that says to be holy as I am holy. Holiness knows it profits or gains you nothing to gain everything in the world and lose your whole soul. To be holy and acceptable is to aim to please God. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be perfect because you will never be perfect. But it means you have a conscious effort and a striving to be. For some of us, a lot of our problems will be eliminated if we just try to be a little more holy. If we just try to be a little more like God. A little less of ourselves and be more like Him. We would see the fullness of God if we aim to be like Him. So holiness. I believe God is calling us back to holiness. And I don't mean like a rigid form of thinking or dress code or way of being. That's not holiness. I mean it in intimacy with him that changes our behavior and changes who we are. That's what holiness is. Amen? 
And finally, in verses 10 and 11, Jesus tells us that in order to really live our blessed lives, we have to be committed to him even when it's not convenient. He's saying that you're blessed when you continue when it's really not profitable for you to do so. That means in the age of everything going viral and one thing you say can be changed against you, it still it needs to proclaim the truth about Jesus when everybody else is afraid to. It means to stand on truth when it's not popular to do so. When you're persecuted for doing so. Talked about. Unfollowed. Blocked. In headlines. When it's not comfortable to do so, you still do it. Because you know the cross wasn't comfortable. Right. Calvary wasn't comfortable and he still went for us. Amen? He tells us to consider it a privilege when that happens to us. Because those who came before us endured the same thing. How sold out to God are you? Are you firmly planted on the foundation of Christ? Or are you easily swayed when things get a little rough? Do you have a price? Can you be bought? To be truly blessed is to be unshakable and unmovable. Um, one of the more Disney classics, well, kind of the underrated classics, is Mulan. Yeah. And there's a scene in that movie where um, Shan Yu, like the Hun, is trying to take over. And he tells the emperor to bow to me. And the emperor says, no matter how the wind howls, the mountain cannot bow to it. No matter what's going on around me, I'm not going to succumb to the pressure. I'm not going to fold. A lot of us would see how truly blessed we are. We would just stop folding under the pressure or giving in at the, little, the littlest faint bit of trouble. No matter what kind of persecution comes we endure, no matter how unpopular and how outdated the world says living for God is, we still endure. Consistency, no matter the convenience. Amen? So Jesus has challenged us, challenged us and called us to humility, sensitivity, <coughs> meekness, mercy, compassion, holiness, and commitment at all costs. That is the kind of character he wants us to have going forward into our new year. Our year is on focus. Let's focus on our character. Seeking the kingdom first and everything else will come. If we get ourselves in alignment with God and let him work out here, everything else externally will come where it's supposed to. So in a world where everyone tells you, just live your best life now, do everything you want to do now for yourself, we're going to change the narrative and do what God wants us to do and be obedient first. We're going to let him work on our character. We're going to focus on him in this new year. Amen? This is how we live our blessed lives. God bless you, my friend. I want to thank you so much for watching this video. I pray that a word was spoken that transforms and changes your life. Please stay connected with us at www.globalfirenow.com. I'd love to hear from you. Expect you.